So, uh, my name is Justin Gariglia, and I grew up in New Jersey, in, in America. Um, and when I had my first opportunity to come over to Europe and, and study art history, I jumped at the opportunity and I went to Venice and studied uh, Venetian art history and uh, Italian literature and high Renaissance architecture in Venice. And then from there, uh, I had an opportunity to go to China, and I went to Beijing and began studying Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and Chinese culture, Chinese history. And when I got over there, I realized that there was a whole different world that was uh, essentially uh, evolving and transforming the planet that was in Asia that we got to see on a daily basis. Um, and only later did I learn about this term called the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene essentially is the uh, new geological epoch that we live in today. It's a new geological period of time. And I'm sure most of you have probably not heard of the term, but you may have heard of the Triassic or the Jurassic period, mm -hmm. you know, of the dinosaurs. Well, now they named a whole new geological period of time after humans, and that's called the Anthropocene. So living in China, you could actually see breathe, smell, touch, and feel the Anthropocene because it was everywhere around us. They were burning coal in all to, to power the kind of the, the, the revolution that was taking place there. The, the, the cap, you know, essentially it was, a, it was capitalism on steroids back in, the, in these days, the 1990s, when uh, Deng Xiaoping and a lot of his policies were being pushed forward all of China was rising up out of poverty. And to do that, they had to burn a lot of coal and to generate a lot of energy. So you'd go out in the winter time and you'd be breathing normally on, on a winter day, and within a few minutes, there would be black particles of, uh, of, of, of carbon that would be coming out of your nose mm -hmm. from, that were just suspended in the air mm -hmm. that you would be breathing in. So you start to realize, oh, well, something's wrong with the air here. You know, and then you see the water, and the waterways were often very polluted, and so you got to you got a sense that there's something else happening there that you didn't see. I didn't see growing up where I grew up in, in, in America, um, and so that's kind of led me down this pathway towards wanting to really focus on how humans are impacting and changing the, the planet. Um, and I spent the next uh, 15 years working for National Geographic uh, magazines and, and also for Geo and. Stern and Spiegel and the New York Times and a lot of different publications and my focus was on how essentially on how the, the, the process of how Asia was transforming and going through this massive revolution um, so how all society was changing culture was changing at the hands of uh, all these economic uh, reforms that were um, so that kind of is the, the backstory for kind of how I got to where I am today. Uh, I became fascinated by what I was seeing and experiencing. And from there I wanted to learn more about how humans were impacting and changing the planet. And I thought it was much more interesting to look at what, was, what the drivers were of what we consider today the most accessible part of all this, which is called climate change or global warming. So you have this thing, global warming, which is actually very downstream from the real problems. Um, it's like kind of the end result of all these other more important things that are happening. So I started really exploring different elements of what the, of the drivers of climate change, what was driving all these issues that we were seeing and experiencing and facing. Um, and that's what brought me to a lot of the works that you see here. So, I mean, I can start going right into the works, or do you want to have, do you want to ask me any questions about that? Hello. Um, yeah, I think uh, global warming, is it real, is it not real? How, yeah. how, how can you, yeah. in, in a couple of words, uh, yeah. tell the, the things apart, you know, between the beliefs and the non-believers? Yeah. I think you have some metrics and some data which so, is very clear. So, so here's the thing, there are no non-believers. 
there are people, at, so I'm just going to speak from an American point of view. In America, there are no non-believers in climate change. There really are. It's a, this is a misnomer. There are people that are paid, there are politicians that are paid to disseminate false information and tell people that there is no such thing as climate change. They, are, they do not believe that. They are paid to say that. And then you have, the, you have the sheep that follow these herds. And so there's nobody really who really genuinely believes climate change is not happening. Because if you, to do that, you have to be a scientist. You cannot sit here and tell somebody climate change is not happening. You have a right to your own truth, but you don't have a right to, your, to reality, right? And the reality is that you, you cannot understand what's happening outside until you go to the scientists who are studying these things, who have devoted their entire lives to studying and understanding what's actually happening to the planet. So you have to go and talk to them, and 99.9% .9 of all of them, the, and the only ones who are not saying climate change is not happening, are the ones that are being paid by the fossil fuel companies to say that. So suddenly, uh, so I'm putting on my activistic uh, mm -hmm. kind of hat there. And then, but, and then I think today, what are the metrics? I mean, you say the CO2 is at 410 ppm, which is the level yeah. we had 60 million years ago when the yeah. water levels uh, yeah. would be 100 so, feet high. Yeah. So the, last, the reason yeah. why we are not seeing it today is because it goes so fast. It takes a long time for the ice to melt. So yeah, so we're at 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. And, and the last time we had that much CO2 in the, in the air, the sea levels all around the world were 60 to 100 feet higher than they are today. So the only reason they're not that high right now is because it takes time for all the ice to melt. But that all that ice is it's in the process of melting right now. Why we stand here today and we talk and we go out and we go shopping and all this stuff's happening in the background. So one of the things that I'm I'm fascinated by are time scales. I'm fascinated by the fact that all around us, there's multiple scales. There's things that are operating on many different levels, many different time scales. So this is one of the things that I, so I spent a lot of time reading uh, a lot of different philosophers that focus on these things. So one of the terms is uh, uh, by a philosopher named Timothy Morton, who coined the term hyperobject. And hyperobjects are things that live in temporal and spatial scales that are non-human. And this is really interesting, a very fascinating thing, because we don't, we're humans, so we think of everything as from a human standpoint. And we often don't think about things in non-human, from a non-human position. And the reality is everything around us, almost everything around us, is living in a non-human scale. It lives in a non-human period of time. So, for instance, the polystyrene panels that we use here, that I use in these works, they live on a whole different temporal scale. We will all be dead, long dead, and that will still be around. Now the glaciers, that ice, the oldest ice in Greenland is 110,000 years old. And it's, but it's melting, obviously, very quickly right now. And it'll be melted, and these prints will still be around. The artworks will still be, if they're protected, they'll, they'll be... Otherwise they will be floating. They might be floating someplace, yes. There's a good chance they'll be floating. So, um, so I got I got really interested in all the different these different you know scales of time, um, and it became a, a really uh, important part of, of this work. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there's a so with this body of work, what I like to say is that there's two important drivers behind this body of work. Um, one is that the the medium is the message. This is a famous philosopher, Canadian philosopher, uh, Marshall McLuhan. This was what titled one of his books, uh, The Medium is the Message. So the material, the medium being the material here is the message for these works. But then also, as you see, there's a play on the, the texture. So you look at it and you see, you're being, your eyes are being deceived, and they make you think that you see dimensionality, and then you go up close and you go to the side and you see there's no dimensionality actually at all. And that is really one of the, one of the uncanny aspects of, of something like climate change global warming. These things are happening, but we don't quite understand exactly what we're seeing, what we're happy, you know, what's happening. And if we can go, if you want to talk about the Kant, the philosopher, who used to talk about this notion of phenomena and nomina. And nomina 
is the thing in and of itself, sans any perception, and then you have the way you perceive that thing. And so humans are always, you know, we're perceiving things, but that perception is not necessarily what is actually existing. And so there's a gap. There's always a gap in our knowledge. And so that's what the, uh, that's why I play with the textures. Uh, the how did you get to, to this? Uh... The relief? Yeah, I mean, it's a special program you it's a process. developed or process with this amazing printer you have? It's a, no, it's not so much the printer. Um, it's, it's a bunch of different steps. I, made, I printed them on, on paper and I just wasn't happy with the... It, it, the message wasn't there. The idea wasn't there. The concept wasn't there. They were nice pictures, but they didn't have the... So they needed, they needed a different material and they needed to have some other type of depth and dimension. That went beyond the actual physicality of the, of the work. So, yeah. Um, what next? Yeah, then I think uh, the other body of work, which is related to agriculture, mining, is on a total different medium. Yeah. Well, so some of the driver, the main driver of global warming is, as you probably all know, is essentially consumption. And when we consume things, we have to use a lot of energy um, to either make what we're consuming or to uh, and the actual process of consuming or for instance you want to drive to the store to go purchase something or buy something you know you're burning fossil fuels you know all along and so um, these works deal with agriculture in the landscape and how humans are impacting the landscape through agriculture and also through through mining and the extraction of resources and materials and that consumption of all those materials is what contributes to essentially what we're seeing today um, in terms of the, the, the planet warming up. Um, I'll give you one other fact, scientific fact. In one of the most recent issues of Nature, which is one of the most uh, important uh, journals, scientific journals, uh, scientists are saying that there is a 93% chance that we are going, uh, the planet will be Rise, the temperature of the planet will be rising up to five degrees, an additional five degrees Celsius by the end of 2100, so by the end of the century. So five degrees Celsius is catastrophic for life on Earth. It's catastrophic. I mean the collapse, essentially the collapse of pretty much all, almost all ecological systems. Um, Humans, we did not. We evolved in uh, a period of time called the Holocene. So the last 11,700 years is what geologists call the Holocene, which is this very uh, it's kind of safe operating space where the, the climate was perfect. It was the perfect condition for us as humans. But as the temperature rise, and, and not only us, but all everything we need around us. So we need pollinators to pollinate the plants for us to eat. And, um, and for all the you know, plants growing and everything else. So that we're, humans are now actively pushing the planet out of balance. And as we push the planet out of balance, what you're gonna see is like a full, full on collapse of ecological systems. So many of us, not all of us, but many of us in here are, are not gonna actually see the, the results of this. It's, but it's gonna be the future generations that are gonna to have to deal with this. And so it's very easy for us to ignore it. It's very convenient for us to kind of push it under the, sweep it under the rug and not have to pay attention to it. But we are actually actively causing the, uh, we're, call, we're gonna be causing a tremendous amount of um, harm for future generations. So there's gonna be a lot of suffering. You know, we, we already have 65 million refugees today with climate change and global warming and the rise of the seas, that they're projecting over 100 million, uh, uh, over 100 million refugees within the next uh, 20, 30 years. So Europeans moving to Africa, I heard when it comes to that. European moving to Africa? <laughs> well, yes, one of the things I read. We lost about five degrees in the small ice age, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. It wasn't man-made, and it was repaired afterwards. Yeah. So if it's man-made. Yeah, so we, we have to have some type of scientific, there has to be some type of science. A question asteroid could come and strike tomorrow, a volcano could erupt, 
tomorrow or even in the, the next few minutes and put a plume of smoke up into the air and then reflect some of the sunlight and cool the planet down. Um, there's a lot of different scenarios, but the current scenario without assuming there's no natural disaster puts us at this very then, high. Then there's the permafrost too, is also disappearing, and that one is really... Yeah, high. so the like, permafrost... Like, like uh, the, the animals, but the viruses are brought back to life, and we have illnesses, yeah. which have disappeared 6,000 years ago, yeah. which suddenly can erupt, and we are not prepared for that. So I've just come from the Arctic Circle. Uh, I was 330 miles north of the Arctic Circle uh, two, just two weeks ago. On a research mission with some scientists and uh, we were out on the permafrost studying the permafrost but they were studying the permafrost I was observing taking photographs uh, and learning and the permafrost is all thawing out right now and it was called permafrost because it's permanently frozen ground but now we are defrosting it because as the earth gets warmer um, it's heating up the surface of this, of this tundra of the land, and it's leading to essentially uh, a lot of microbial uh, organisms that are coming back to life. Because a lot of these microbes, they can they go go to sleep when they freeze, mm -hmm. and now they're coming back to life, and they're starting the anaerobic process where they're starting to consume, and they're starting to consume, and as they consume, they pump out methane. The off gas is methane and a little bit of carbon dioxide. Methane is incredibly potent uh, greenhouse gas, goes up into the atmosphere. It lasts much shorter life than carbon dioxide, but it's much, much more powerful uh, in terms of trapping heat. And so it's this incredible uh, cycle that's taking place. And so what we see is that, uh, what the scientists have been teaching me is that this is all, these are, these are not linear progressions. These are all exponential progressions. So one thing compounds on another thing and another thing, and then next thing you know, Knock here is going to be, well, you know, you have three months now, you've had it very, been very warm. Maybe yes. next year you may have four months or five months. It's just going to continue to escalate like this. It's not going to be like this. Um, and all the, because, because of all these, what they call feedback loops. Uh, it's the same with the ice, the way the ice is melting. In the Arctic, the, the, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. And, and it's like, you think, you think oh, how is that possible? So I asked the scientists, I said, why is this happening? And they said, well, you have to understand, when the ice melts and the ice, the sea ice disappears, what do, you, what do you have left? You have only the ocean. And the ocean is dark. And the ice is bright white. So the ice reflects all of the sun's rays and shoots it right back up into the atmosphere, right? So it doesn't, so the heat, it's, it's not going to heat up as much as the dark ocean. The dark ocean absorbs all the sunlight and heats up. So as a result, it's doubling, it's, it's, it's warming twice as fast in the Arctic region than it is in the rest of the planet. So again, it's another feedback loop. And as that accelerates, the ocean is going to get warmer, the ice is, more ice is going to melt, and as more ice melts, it absorbs more heat, and everything just, again, it's this exponential curve. So we're, we're really actively uh, destroying it. And, and the reality is, though, the blame is not, you are not guilty. You know, you're really not, none of us are really guilty in, 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 in this whole process. The, in reality, who's guilty are the fossil fuel companies, which have known for a very long time what they were doing, and that this was gonna to lead to the destruction, of essentially, of the planet. And so, uh, but this is a whole other, and we get into politics and everything else, so. Um, you know, and, and if we go home and we recycle, and, and we, you know, we go and we separate our paper from our aluminum cans, our Coke bottles, uh, you know, it's kind of like being at home and watching it a game on TV, a football game or something on TV, where you're shouting in front of the TV thinking that what you're gonna do is you're gonna help change things, but in reality it doesn't, it really doesn't. There are much bigger, more powerful entities that need to really change the way they uh, behave uh, for us to actually have any, uh, have any impact.
go back to your work, yeah. uh, what, what I was very impressed about is that you, you really think about the process and about the medium. And you chose those honeycomb panels. Uh, they are very light, extremely strong, uh, very durable. And then you, as a photographer, still want to be a painter. Like you use uh, linen uh, to cover the panel. Yeah. And then you go into the gesso process, which is a very uh, tiring process to get it extremely smooth. Yeah. And then you will add, uh, if it's a gold mine, maybe gold leaf or palladium or pewter or on top of it, and then you will use this printer which you developed and, and print finally the photo yeah. on, on, on the work. I mean, uh, I think it's, it's pretty impressive the process you go through to make it something. It's a labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a lot of uh, studying you have been doing to, to get to this point. I want the work to last a long time. I want it to have uh, a certain aesthetic that uh, resonates for me and uh, I don't want to fall apart you know so uh, the process is the process is the process I you know it's just I like to make things with my hands so we, everything is handmade in the studio so. thank you uh, thank you I'll leave you with one more quote one of my favorite quotes and that is uh, you know in the past, artists' role was to create uh, fiction, right? And, 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 and today we live in a world of fictions. So artists' role today is really to create reality. And so that's very much what my work is about, trying to help present reality, uh, another way to see and understand reality, have access to reality. So anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.